Welcome to my lab. I'm Drew Collip. In today's lab, we're going to examine plates coated with E. coli bacteria. First, we'll examine the results of plating bacteria two different ways. We will then harvest the bacteria from the surface of the agar plates and then centrifuge to pellet the cells, finally resuspending the cell pellet in buffer. Here you can see two stacks of plates. This stack has a lawn of E. coli across the surface, meaning the entire surface is covered in E. coli bacteria. You can see the edges are not quite covered. This stack is streaked. You can see it zigzags back and forth until we have some single colonies growing on the edge. These are two different ways of plating E. coli bacteria. We use an inoculation loop. We move back and forth, sterilize, and then move back and forth again. Eventually we want to get a single cell on its own that'll grow into a colony. Here we're going to use the E. coli plates that have a lawn, meaning completely covered in E. coli. This is done using a bent rod we call a hockey stick. It can be seen here on the right. We're going to use Tris EDTA buffer to harvest the cells. What we'll do is we'll take the lid off a plate. We will pour a little bit of our TE buffer on the surface. We're doing this so when we scrape off the E. coli, it'll have some place to go into other than sitting on top of the agar itself. We take the hockey stick and we gently scrape. Be careful not to break the agar. It is like jello. You can see the bacteria comes off as long as we scrape gently. I will take this one down, open the next lid, and pour into the next dish, scraping off E. coli into the next one. We need about five plates total to get enough cells to harvest DNA. We then repeat the process with the following plates. You can start to see the E. coli themselves. You can see they are, come off as a white goo, if you will. Again, be careful not to scrape too hard with the hockey stick because it will rip the agar. Pouring is fine from one dish to another. I would not recommend pouring from the final dish into your tube. It can be quite messy. We don't care about sterile technique when we're doing this because in the end we're going to be lysing the cells and extracting DNA. If sterility was an issue, you would have to use a different technique for this. Now that we have five plates collected, it's time to transfer them to our centrifugation tubes. These tubes are designed to withstand the high force of a large Sorval centrifuge. To transfer it, I'm going to use a pipette controller and a serological pipette. Again, sterility is not important at this point in time. We'll pipette the slurry we've made and place it into our centrifugation tube. There will be quite an odor. There's a reason why E. coli smells. We'll add a bit more of our buffer. Again, don't press too hard on the agar. It will be damaged. Try and get any residuals scraped off with that hockey stick. and into our centrifugation tube. Be sure to dispose of everything in the proper location, usually biohazard. We now have 
a single centrifugation tube. You can see the E. coli is in there. If we want to remove the buffer, we are going to centrifuge it. Because we only have one tube, we need a balance. When we add our tubes into the centrifuge, we want them to be identical in mass. We will make sure that is the case. Here is our tube with our E. coli bacteria. We read off the mass, 32.82 grams. I made a water balance. That is another centrifugation tube with just water. 32.82 grams. Notice the mass is identical. Please ensure you do this before you use a centrifuge. This large centrifuge has a handle that opens right here. You can see it's hinged, it opens up. Inside is the rotor. Here's the rotor, it actually detaches. You can see there's two wheels, an upper wheel with an arrow that says off, and a lower wheel that's red. We rotate it the same direction clockwise for off. We open the lid. Underneath you can see threads here. This rotor is actually detachable and can be removed. We can swap it out for different sizes. We must actually screw this rotor down to the axle. Here are our samples. You can see we put one on one side. We then draw a line with our finger through the middle of the rotor and here's where the other one goes. They must be in balance. If not, the rotor will be damaged. When we put the lid back on, make sure the threads go in the center right here. Place it on. We'll screw down the large red one first and then the small black one. They screw down in a counterclockwise fashion. This is attaching a rotor to the axle, so make sure it's nice and tight. Once the lower one is secure, move to the upper one. Make sure it's very tight. One thing I do is I always pull up on the rotor itself to make sure it doesn't move at all. That way you can be sure it's secured. We will now close the door to the centrifuge. To adjust settings, we use the screen located over here. On this model, it is not a touch screen. If you notice, the rotor was labeled SS34. Always double check to make sure the right settings are there. If they are correct, press enter. Now we want to adjust the speed. We can cursor down. We'll set this to 8000 RPM. We'll set the time to 10 minutes. I will leave the temperature at 4 degrees. When all the settings are in place, press the start button. The machine will begin to accelerate up. My advice is place your hand along the top of the machine. If it's not in balance, you'll feel vibration. You can stop it. You'll feel the vibration before it causes any damage to the machine itself. You can see the acceleration ramping up. About 3600 RPM it will stop, check to see if they're in balance, and if they are, it will continue on. It'll go up to 8000 RPM. Never walk away from a centrifuge until it reaches top speed. You always want to make sure your tubes are in balance. If not, it can damage the machine and potentially rip through the side and damage the workers in the room with the machine itself. Notice the machine starts to shake. This is just the compressor for the refrigeration unit maintaining the 4 degree temperature you have set. Now that the machine is at top speed, feel free to walk away and come back when the run is done. You may have noticed I've fast forwarded the video. There's less than a minute left in the run. See what happens when the run is done. Time is now up. You can see it says decelerate. And the RPMs are decreasing. Please wait until this reaches zero. It is unsafe to open the centrifuge while the rotor is still spinning. The rotor has now reached zero. It is now safe to open and remove your samples. To open, turn the upper one clockwise, then the lower one. Depending on how tight you set this, it can be quite difficult to open. Take your time. Remove the lid. You can see our samples inside. Gently remove them. The cells have pelleted down to the bottom. Here they are. You can see they're in a small pellet. We do not want to disturb that pellet just yet. 
Here's our balance. Notice I didn't use water. I used another DNA sample to try and maximize DNA for the next experiment. Back to the lab now. Be gentle as you carry them back. Anything that disturbs the pellet, you may have to re-centrifuge. We refer to this mass at the bottom of the centrifuge tube as the pellet. The liquid above, we refer to that as the supernatant. We will now remove the supernatant and resuspend the pellet. You can pour it off. That is poor technique. I will use a pasture pipette to transfer to a waste container. Again, sterile technique here is not important as I will be lysing the cells to extract DNA. As a result, I am not using aseptic technique. We want to remove as much supernate as possible, but we don't want to get too greedy and try and disturb the pellet. Notice the pellet sticks along the side, not exactly on the bottom, because of where the force is applied when it's spinning in the rotor in the centrifuge. We've now removed all the supernatant, leaving behind just the pellet. Even though I don't care about the sterility of the sample, I don't want to contaminate the lab. I must place these objects in biohazard. I will now resuspend the pellet in my TE buffer. Here I will use a serological pipette and a pipette controller. I'll resuspend in 5 mils of TE buffer. I will open the lid, place in my 5 mils TE buffer. I will then pipe that up and down, spraying the pellet off in an attempt to resuspend into this buffer. This is quite a large pellet and can be difficult to resuspend. I will use the end of the pipette to try and scrape it off the bottom. Please note, these cells will not be dissolved in the buffer, they will be suspended in the buffer itself. You can see the solution is getting quite milky and the pellet is virtually gone from the side. Now that I'm done, I will make sure I dispose of my serological pipette in biohazard as to not contaminate the lab. Now that our cells have been resuspended in the buffer, I will transfer it to a glass test tube for storage. Glass test tubes can be sealed with what is called parafilm. It is like wax. We'll place it on the top and stretch it over, sealing up the top completely. I will label it and store it for DNA extraction. Until next time.